I really should make videos more often so my hair doesn't look different in every single video. It's me, Willow. After a disgusting online semester, back at it again to ruin your favorite Netflix show. This time, we're talking about the Queen's Gambit. Did I binge the whole show because I just couldn't stop? Yes. Did my little bisexual heart beat for Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomas Brody Sandstory at the same time? Maybe. However, do I love this show so much that I ended up contributing to the boom in sales of chess sets? Hmm. There's no evidence proving such an accusation. But here's the thing though. As much as I enjoyed little Beth Harmon slaughtering the patriarchy in the chessboard, while looking pretty, something just didn't sit right with me. So after I finished watching the show, I started thinking. And horrible things happen when a woman starts to think. Before I rip it apart, I just want to assure you that I'm not canceling this show. But if you're watching this video just for the burn, you can find the time code below. Anyways, The Queen's Gambit is still a pretty good show. To say the least, it's what we need right now. Seeing orphan girl who turns out to be a genius going against all odds to stand on the top of the board is exactly what we need in the 89th month of COVID quarantine. We want to see something work out. We want to see someone win. And we really, really, really need something new to fill the time. So, the Queen's Gambit checked all of our boxes for a comfort blanket. On the one hand, the whole story is very satisfying. There is very little moral ambiguity in this show. <clears throat> okay, I'll talk about that later. The obstacles outside of Beth are either objective, like poverty or being an orphan, or professional, like Borgoff, or just actually horrible people that the audience have no problem hating, like her trash of a stepfather. Because of her underdog origin, Beth herself is a character that we can very easily root for and identify with. And that type of protagonist is what we need to see right now. You know what else about this show makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside? The side characters. Aww. Most people treated Beth with kindness. Mr. Scheibel taught her how to play, introduced her to coaches, lent her money. Her stepmother supported her career. Jolene lent her money as well, her opponents respected her, Harry and Benny helped to train her, and Towns... Ah... Towns... This show partly restored my faith in humanity in a time when people would rather risk killing someone than wearing a piece of cloth over their ugly fucking faces. We want something to work out for someone, and the Queen's Gambit did exactly that. It all worked out for the little Beth Harmon. So, it's a really smooth story, but that also made it pretty shallow. On the other hand, this show's formal elements also made the whole experience all the more enjoyable. Anya Taylor-Joy has this je ne sais quoi that makes everything she does magical. It's those eyes, I think. And honestly, I don't think the show would have worked had they cast a different actress. Anya's performance adds a depth to this very shallow story because the way she portrays this character lets you see her thoughts through her expressions. Thoughts that are not written in the script. For example, in the scene where Teenage Beth plays the 8 year old little genius, uh, it was ATJ's idea to try to psych out the kid. That's what a good actress does to a bad script. The show also did a lot to make the audience feel smart and that's a big gesture considering how many people don't know what day of the week it is right now. There are a lot of videos and articles talking about how serious they were about chess, so I'm just not going to blabber more about it. I've linked a few videos and articles down below. Go check it out only after you finish this one, okay? Moreover, the whole vintage 60s aesthetic is escapism at its best. You're brought to a time when everyone dressed pretty, the economy was burgeoning, and the fight for equality wasn't grabbing white people by the tits. So what if kids are getting married out of high school? It's a marvelous time with great music. So in all, the 
Queen's Gambit is the epitomic feel-good show. It could just stay that way. You may leave the show feeling like you need more, and that's when you should go eat that leftover pie from Thanksgiving and stop thinking about the show. Because once you start thinking, you will notice the very obvious flaws of the Queen's Gambit underneath its pretty visuals. Here's my beef with the Queen's Gambit, more specifically the script of the Queen's Gambit, because Anya Taylor Joy did a lot to make it less bad, and I cannot discredit my girl on that one. The whole story has very little character development, and because of that, Beth Harmon becomes a legend rather than a real living person. It would have been fine if it was like Indiana Jones, and the selling point of the show is the chess games. Rather than the coming of age story of an orphan girl who turns out to be a chess genius, the problem is, Beth barely came of age. She was at age most of the time. She's always good at chess. She's always smart, and she's pretty much always being addicted. These are her character traits that we see in the first few episodes that got carried through the show. But character traits are not the same as character development. The script did a pretty sloppy job depicting Beth's journey of change and her battle with addictions. Allow me to demonstrate. First of all, what are the big changes for Beth? Most obviously, her looks. She went from this little orphan with old dresses to this glamorous starlet. Unfortunately, the script has very little to do with this change in appearance, because as ADJ mentioned in an interview with Rotten Tomatoes, the fashion was actually mostly her choice. She was putting herself in Beth's shoes and thinking about what influenced Beth's fashion choices as a teenager, and that's wonderful acting, but not necessarily good writing. Another big growth. Is bad as chess playing, and that did not change much either. At least not on screen. The show had already set her up as an invincible and fearless prodigy. She was undergoing training, indeed, but the training scenes for Beth and Harry, as well as Beth and Benny, are more about her relationships with these two men than the improvement of her chess skills. So really, we never see her struggle with chess playing, except for the board golf games. It is satisfying to see her keep winning, but it's not good writing. Screenwriting 101: Conflicts develops a story, and obstacles develop a character. Even though chess is such a big part of Beth's life, we don't actually see her progress, and that's why this character feels flat sometimes, because she's just always been good at chess, and her chess career is a smooth sail. On the contrary. The 2005 Disney Channel film *Ice Princess* is a much better portrayal of how a prodigy grows. I've said it, and I'm not taking it back. Like Beth Harmon, Casey Carlyle started as an uncut gem as well. She's super talented at figure skating, has a passion for it, but never truly started until she wanted to do a physics project on figure skating. Turns out she's hella good at it, and that's where *Ice Princess* does better than *The Queen's Gambit*. The writers gave her hell for chasing her dreams. She doesn't have enough money, so she has to work at the rink and tutor other skaters to pay for lessons. She has to juggle her schoolwork, skating, and jobs, so her grades went down. She has to choose between going to Harvard and following her dream of becoming a skater. But like in any Disney movies, she overcame these obstacles, learned what she really wanted to do, and eventually came out a better person in both skating and in life. Just like Beth, Casey is a prodigy, but her success is a lot more meaningful than Beth's because we see her working for it, because we see Casey's growth as a person in dealing with the obstacles of becoming a better skater. We've seen her fall and get back up on ice, and we've seen her fall and get back up in life. The way someone deals with failures in their lives humanizes them and enables active changes in a person, and that's why writers sometimes have to sacrifice the feel goodness for conflicts so they can build a more three-dimensional character. 
Unfortunately, Bass was just not written to be one of those characters. To be clear, I'm not saying there's no obstacle for Bass, but I have mentioned that most of these obstacles are more objective than subjective, and Bath is simply reacting to these situations that she got thrown into, but not really responsible for. Unlike Casey having to choose between going to Harvard and skating, which are two of her biggest desires in life, Bath did not have to choose most of the time. The only time she does is in her battle with addiction. Is your alcoholism and tranquilizers were fed as a kid getting in the way of your chess playing? Here's a word from someone just like you about how they quit drugs and drinking. It's like boom, boom. I put it in the trash like slam. slam. I hear the cops screaming and damn. damn. I swear that I'm telling you the facts. That's how I beat crap. Yeah. What the fuck is up with that? Okay, it's not like I want to see her suffer from addiction and withdrawal, but I do kind of expect her to get messed up considering how obsessed the director is with showing the thrills of drugs and alcohol. I'm just upset that they put struggling with addiction in a synopsis, but never truly show the struggles. It's like a slap in the face for people who had actually been through the whole rehabilitation process. Her addiction has no adverse effect on her playing, or basically anything in her life. In fact, it kind of helped her. Yes, she did lose to Borgoff partly because she partied too hard and was late to the game, but the show made it pretty clear that Borgoff is the mega boss, and Bath was not supposed to win the first game anyways. There is one player that scares me. Who? The Russian. It's not a direct result of her drinking and pill taking. Then her 20 minutes of downward spiral after losing just led to nowhere. Jesus fucking Christ. Similarly, her addiction didn't make Harry and Benny kind of disappointed in her, but it did not really affect the relationship considering how they all came together and made international calls to help her in the end. What would have made this show perfect? is some extra time between Beth deciding to quit drugs and the final game against Borgoff, showing her dealing with withdrawal and realizing through herself that she actually had it in her, and it's not just the pills helping. But the script is just structured in such a way that they had to push all of her self-discovery to the last 30 minutes of this 7-hour show and force emotional climax with the ceiling game at the end. And that! My friend, it's what we call bad writing. I'm just mad that they missed, no, 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 ignored an opportunity to truly show this woman's resilience and strength in fighting her own demons, facing her own mistakes, and truly changing for the better with a realistic portrayal of addiction. That's the problem when men attempt to write strong women. And let me take a step forward and just say this whole show deserves to be the top post of r slash men writing women. I truly believe that ATJ has done her best to humanize Beth and bringing a female perspective in this, and I so appreciate her for that. But it's not difficult to see the male gaze deeply rooted in the source material and the script, both written by straight white men. They think a woman is strong because she's better than the men, but still she had to win the last game with the help of those men she defeated. And she's also strong because she can easily succeed at anything she decides to do, whether it's chess or quitting drugs. She's also strong because she's not like the other women. Yeah. Name one other woman in the show that compares with Beth. I fucking dare you. She's not like her borderline insane mother who puts herself and her daughter in danger. She's not like the other girls in her high school who was only thinking about boys and got knocked up. She's not like Jolene who wasn't born with talents and has to work hard to get what she wants. And she's not like her stepmother who succumbed to drugs and alcohol and died a sad death. Beth is the perfect woman. The Madonna and the whore. She's 
beautiful, she's smart, she's unbeatable, and to spice it up a little bit, she's also down to experiment and fuck another woman. And by the way, that part with the French girl, that's not by visibility, it's by fetishization. It served no purpose to the plot other than saying, yo look, she's so open but she kind of fucked up y'all. She has to be all these things, to be worthy of men's respect. And all the other women are just kind of failures compared to Beth. This, not like the other girls' troop, coupled with the lack of character development, essentially makes Beth Harmon a legend. She needs no improvement, she's born perfect, it's an unrealistic male fantasy wrapped in a cover of a female coming of age story. And that's the most problematic part of this show. Mark my words, men do not know how to write about women. And if you're a male writer watching this video, please, 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 please let your girlfriend, wife, female friends, or just your mom read your stuff and just be really humble and taking their thoughts. I don't give a fuck how big of a feminist you think you are. You don't know shit about writing women. Ask a woman. It's not that fucking hard. Okay, I'm done screaming. In all, Queen's Gambit, pretty entertaining. I can tell you is the saving grace and don't think about it afterwards. And man cannot be trusted to write women. If you've learned something from this video, please support this unemployed girl and give me a thumb up, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel so the organism can pick me up. I'll see you next time.